Hi, I'm Wendy from Shiny Happy World, and there is a new pattern in the Funny Faces Quilt Block of the Month Club. It is April 15th, 2021, as I'm recording this, and um, the new pattern releases today in honor of Mother's Day, which is coming up next month before we go to a new pattern. We have a mama and baby kangaroo. So, um, just to give you the where to find everything. So if you're a member of the Funny Faces Quilt Block of the Month Club, you'll find this pattern now to download in the clubhouse. If you're not a member yet, you can join and you'll get immediate access to this pattern. And if you're not in the club or if you're watching this after May 15th, which is when we'll switch over to a new pattern, you'll find this pattern in the shop at Shiny Happy World sometime, usually the first week of June. So. That is the overview on where to get this pattern. Next, I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of how I do Quilt As You Go because all of my quilts, I use Quilt As You Go for them. So in a nutshell, the super nutshell version, and there's a link in the pattern to a longer workshop that shows all of these steps in much more detail. But the way I make my quilts is first, I quilt the background fabric to the batting. And if you look at the back of it, well, you can't see it very well because it's a light color but the, the quilting lines go underneath the applique. So I applique, I, I quilt that entire block really easy. So I just am doodle stitching in there. After I'm done with that, I press it, let it cool on the ironing board so it's nice and flat. And then I do my applique on top of the quilted block. And then I do all of my outline stitching. Then I trim it down to size. I trim all of my blocks to 10 and a half inches square so that they'll finish at 10 inches square when I sew it together. Sew them together with the other blocks using a quarter inch seam allowance. And then I press all of those seams open to minimize bulk because I am sewing the batting in the seams. It's cotton batting, so it's very, very thin. But you press those seams open and that's when I add my backing. So I don't add the backing until after everything else is all quilted and assembled. Add the backing and then I do one more round of quilting just stitch in the ditch on the seam allowance on the seams between the blocks. So that is um, still a little bit of quilting after everything is all assembled, but it's very minimal quilting. It's just straight lines and it takes me about a half an hour to do a nap size quilt, which is what I use on the sofa. Um, and I can I can do stitching with the whole mass of the quilt for just a half an hour and it's all straight lines. And then you bind it just like you would any other quilt with whatever binding method you like the best. So that is the nutshell version of how I do quilt as you go. Now I'm gonna talk, show you specifically how to make this kangaroo block. Okay, the first thing you need to do is print out the pattern. You can either print it onto regular paper and then trace it onto your fusible adhesive, or um, this is what I like to use. I use Heat and Bond Light. These are printable, fusible adhesive sheets. Whichever way you do this, you need to get the pattern onto the paper side of the fusible adhesive. It's already been reversed and exploded, uh, so all of the pieces are separate, nothing is overlapping. Um, and this one is two pages because that mama's body is very big. She actually goes off the block. She's cropped off of the block on three different sides. I'm just interrupting myself here to talk about sizing. So all of my patterns are designed to fit a block that finishes at 10 inches square, which means when you finish doing all of the applique and everything, you're gonna trim it to be 10 and a half inches square so that when you sew it together with a quarter inch seam allowance on all sides, you end up with a block that's 10 by 10. So on most of my patterns, you really don't have to worry too much at the, about the sizing, but on one like this, where you do have it cutting off on three sides of the block, it's very important that you print it out at the correct size. So I can't give specific insp instructions because every printer and every print driver is a little bit different, but you wanna look for somewhere on your printer where it's telling you that you're printing it at 100% size. It could also say no scale or no scaling, but you wanna make sure that you're printing it out at full size. And you'll wanna double check this before you sew all of your blocks, all of you cut your pieces out or anything like that. You wanna check on your printed out pattern and make sure from this flat edge to this flat edge is 10 and a half inches. So 
print your pattern out at 100% scale or no scaling, whatever your printer says to get it to print out at the, the full size. And then just to double check, measure it from this straight line to this straight line and make sure that it is 10 and a half inches from flat edge to flat edge. That way you know that it will completely fill your block when it's 10 inches square. If your printer is off by just a little bit, and sometimes they are, which is why you want to double check it. It's why all clothing patterns where the size is really, really crucial have a little block on there telling you um, that you should measure to double check. As long as your edge to edge is more than 10 inches, you're going to be okay. So if it falls somewhere between 10 and 10 and a half inches, you're gonna be all right and you don't need to worry about, about fussing. It, mean, if, it means that these edges might be not cropped completely. You might have a little sliver of background block showing behind them when you trim your block to size. But once you sew it together to the other blocks, that cut edge will be hidden in your seam allowance. So as long as you're more than 10 inches, um, but doesn't quite have to be 10 and a half inches, you're going to be okay. But definitely, if it is less than 10 inches from edge to edge, you need to check your printer settings. So now back to what I was saying. So she is very large, and then we have a second page with all of the small pieces. So once you get it onto the paper side of your fusible adhesive, you're going to do what we call a, a rough cut. And that means you're gonna cut a little bit outside the solid line. Um, don't, for now, ignore all of the dotted lines in here, just worry about the solid lines. So you're gonna cut it out a little, leave a little bit of extra space outside all of the solid lines, and then fuse it to the back side of your fabric. So this one's got a lot of pieces. We've got a baby's head, the mama's body. We've got two eyes and two noses. Uh, two ears for the baby, and then uh, two ears for the mama and the mama's arm and her pouch, and one little hoof for mama. So after you get that all fused down, we're gonna come back and talk about cutting out the pieces. Okay, after you get all of the pieces cut out roughly, fused to the back side of your fabric, now we're gonna do what I call the clean cut in the instructions. And for this, it's gonna be just a nice clean cut all the way around right on that solid line. Again, we're still gonna ignore all of the dotted lines that are inside the pattern. We're gonna talk about those in the next video. But the reason that you do a rough cut first and then a fuse and then the clean cut, if you had cut this piece out first on the line, then fused it to the fabric, then you'd have to cut it out again right on that line and you'd want to get it cut exactly on that line. And if you're off by even a thread, you're gonna have a loose thread, a thread that has no adhesive on it, and that is a chance for fraying in the wash. So by cutting it out a little bit bigger than it needs to be and then fusing it and then doing the final cut, now the adhesive goes past the edge where we're gonna cut, which means that we are cutting through the adhesive, and that means that that adhesive is covering every last thread of this piece. So cut all of your pieces out on the solid lines, and then in the next video, I'm gonna talk about what, about what all of these dotted lines are inside all of the pattern pieces. Okay, here's all of the pieces and they've all been clean cut, so they are ready to use. And I just wanna show you how, what, these, um, what these markings mean and how we're gonna use them. So you can see it most clearly on this mama's body piece. These dotted lines are showing you where other pieces are either going to sit entirely on top of this piece, like her arm does, or it's gonna show you where pieces overlap, like this is where her ears come out of her head. So they're either gonna overlap or underlap. And um, it'll, it'll make more sense in the next video where I show it layering together. But right now I wanna just talk about how you transfer these markings to the fabric side so you can see them. So right now, while it's on the paper and the paper is fused to the fabric, you can very easily take these pieces over up to a window. And if you put them 
with the paper on the back up against the window, the light will shine through and you can see these lines very clearly on the front side of the fabric. Even when it's a dark colored fabric, you can see it. And you're gonna transfer those lines onto the fabric. So I use a few different tools. The first thing I do is grab my Sharpie, just a simple Sharpie fine tip marker. It's a permanent pen and I use that to mark where the eyes are gonna go, and I also, if this was a piece that had lines that were gonna be stitched like a mouth or like whiskers, I would do those in the Sharpie also. It's a permanent pen, it's not gonna wash out, and it's black. So I only use it where, for example, I'm gonna applique a black piece right over it, so the lines aren't gonna show through that black piece. Or where I'm gonna stitch directly on my line like I would if it was mouth, a mouth or whiskers or anything like that. But you can see on this mama piece that I have marked where the eye is going to go. And I did the same thing on this baby's head, the baby's head. So I don't use the, the, the black marker very much, but I do use it in a couple of key places and it's really, really easy to see. So it's my preferred uh, marker, but you have to use it in places where it's going to be completely covered up later. So for everywhere else, as much as possible, I use just a plain white chalk, and that's what you can see on these pieces. You can probably see it most clearly on this baby, his head, because it's a little bit darker than the mama's body. Um, so I just transfer all of those lines onto the front side of the fabric. So all of the pieces on this kangaroo, um, you can see the white chalk line. If I was doing something with a much lighter fabric where the white line was not going to show, I don't use a colored chalk. I find it's very hard to get the colored chalk markings out. I use just a regular pencil. This is just a Ticonderoga number two pencil, nothing fancy. And uh, I'll use that to mark on any lighter fabrics, which I don't have here. But if I did, this is what I would use. The only thing is I do not use the colored eraser, whether it's a red eraser or a black one like on this pencil. Most pencil erasers have color to them and that does leave a smudge that's really difficult to get out. So to erase any pencil lines and also chalk lines, I use just a white artist eraser. These are very inexpensive. You can get it at any art supply store or craft store. Um, it's just a basic white plastic eraser and it doesn't leave any marking behind any colored smudge and it will erase both the chalk lines and the pencil lines. So those are the three, um, the three markings, the, the types of marking uh, utensils that I'll use. And I just transfer all of these dotted lines onto the fabric side. That way we'll be able to, in the next step, peel that paper away and you'll still have those markings there to use as a guide. And I'll show you there, you'll see those markings in use. Okay, now we're gonna layer all the pieces in and I'm gonna show you how those markings come into play. And uh, this is a little complicated. This is more complicated than most of my blocks that are just kind of a head and ears and a face. This one's got two animals and a lot of pieces for each animal. So here's where we're gonna start. The mama's body, just to kind of remind you, this has got straight cuts on three sides. So those are the edges of your blocks. This is what you're gonna trim your block down to. This is as, So this is from here to here is 10 and a half inches. So as long as you put that um, up against the far side, and I'll show you what I mean here. So I've cut my, I usually cut my blocks a little bit bigger than the 11 inches that I recommend just because I have a stash of already quilted blocks and I never know exactly what I'm gonna use them for. So I usually cut mine a little bit bigger, but if, as long as you make this edge of the body go up against where the batting is, and my batting ends right here, you can see. Um, as long as you make it go over to that edge, you're gonna have enough space over here, so don't center it in the block because then you're gonna have her chopped off here. Slide her all the way over so that her straight edge here, the back side of her, is pretty even, pretty flush with your batting edge over there, and that will give you a full 10 and a half inches this way, 
for the up and down, it's pretty straightforward. This is your bottom edge of your block and this is gonna be your cut top cut edge of your block. So get that body piece oriented in there and if you need to bring a ruler over and measure and make sure you've got 10 and a half inches, you can do that at this point. Um, but do that with the great big body piece. Next up, I'm gonna put in some of the mama's, the, the mama's ears. So on this one, I've got a curvy line here and a little straight line here. And you can see on the body piece that there's a little place there and that is showing you where this ear, whoops, I just shifted that. That shows you where this ear tucks under the head. And as long as you tuck it under and then cover up the line on the ear piece, this tells you where it's being placed and this tells you how much to overlap it and then you're good. And that curved line is gonna become kind of a continuous line here and that's gonna show me where this ear goes. So this ear doesn't tuck underneath anything, it's the ear for this side of her head. So you peel the backing off and this one's got two lines on it. It's showing this edge of the head and the other ear. So this is just gonna show you where it overlaps. So this is telling me where on the head it goes. And this line is showing me where it overlaps the ear. So that kind of becomes a nice continuous line. And this one up here shows you where the edge of the body piece is under there. So you've got a couple of different guidelines to help you get things into place. And you can always tweak them a little bit if you want to, but this gives you an idea of where they go. So the next piece up in, the, in layers from the bottom is the pouch piece. And this has got a number of lines showing me the edge of her body. And you can also see the baby's mouth, his ear, and a little bit of hoof there. So peel that paper off. And now I can use those lines. I've got a line here that's showing me this is what I need to cover up with the curve of the pouch. And this line is showing the curve of her body underneath the pouch. And this line for the baby's head should kind of connect to this line on her body showing where the head goes. So now I've got that pouch positioned in place. Next up is her arm. The arm is very easy. This shows you very clearly where her arm goes. There we go. And now I've got a hoof piece and the hoof has a whole bunch of lines on there. Um, the most important one really is where it overlaps the hand there, the end of her leg. There we go. Now we're gonna put the baby's head on. So the head, if you look at the reference photo, the head comes up, you never see this top edge of the pouch. So the head comes up like this and I'm just lining up the mouth with the, the drawn lines on the pouch for the mouth, that transferred lines. And I can see that that's transferred well because now the ear is also lining up. So I'm gonna take one of the baby's ears, the one that just has, it doesn't, it just underlaps the head. It doesn't go into this stuff over the, the hand and the hoof. So we tuck that underneath the head, and then we take the other ear, and it also tucks underneath the head and on top of the hoof. Tuck that in a little bit more. There we go. I want a little bit of the join from the hoof to the leg to be showing there. All right, now we've got some eyes. You've got two eyes, they're both just straight ovals. They're labeled on the paper, but once you cut them out, they don't have labels on them. So the mama's ears eye is the one that's a little bit bigger than the baby's eye. Just a little bit though, baby's eyes are really big relative to the size of their head. And then we've got two noses and the nose that has just a single line on it, that's the mama's nose. And it just tucks over the end of her snout there. And that line, that curved line is showing you where it overlaps her snout, the end of her, the end of her face. And then the baby's nose 
has lines showing you where his snout goes under there as well. And there you go. So now I'm gonna take this over to the ironing board. I'm gonna double check, make sure I've got everything where I want it. Then I'm gonna fuse it into place. That's gonna be a permanent set, but I do still need to outline it. So after I fuse it into place, I let it cool on the ironing board. And then I take it over to the sewing machine and I do all of the outline stitching. And I will come back in a video and show you all of that outline stitching when it's done. All right, here's the finished block. All of the outline stitching is done. Now, on a lot of my blocks, I, I kind of map out my stitching ahead of time to make sure to try and minimize the number of times I need to stop and tie a knot because that's annoying. But on a block that's this complicated, I really don't worry about it too much. I just bite the bullet and say I'm going to tie a knot. Um, so what you want to do when, when you're planning your, your outlining is make sure that you're sewing the topmost pieces first. Outline, the, outline those top pieces first because that establishes lines for you to connect to. And what I mean is by topmost pieces, look for the pieces where nothing else overlaps them. So on this block, that's going to be this top ear, the eyes, and the noses. So I outline all of the colored pieces three times because I like kind of a little bit of a sketchy look to it. I want it to look like something out of my sketchbook, but I don't bother with that on the eyes and the noses because they're just black and it's black thread on a black background and you can't see it anyway. So I outline each of those just once, but everything else I outline three times. So in this case, I would outline the ear three times, this top ear, and then the next one underneath that is going to be the body, but the body has the arm on top of that, and the arm has that ear on top of that, and that ear has the head on top of that. So that's the next thing I'm gonna outline. So I'll outline the head, and then I will outline this ear, and then I'll outline this ear, and then I could go to the pouch next, but the hoof and the arm is over the pouch. So the hoof is over the arm, so I'll do the hoof next, and then I can do the pouch, and then I can do the arm, and then I can do the body here and down here and on the back. And then the last thing I would do is this bottom ear because it's underneath this ear and that part of her head. So always, that's just a general guideline on any of my patterns. Start on the top by doing this ear first. That tells you where you're gonna connect this line and where this line is going to connect. And by doing this line before this line, you know where this one is gonna connect. It just gives you some anchor points and makes it really easy to connect all of the lines. So this is the one that I did. I used the rainbow sherbet background as the uh, rainbow sherbet fabric bundle as the background and warm neutrals for the kangaroo. But as always, I like to make samples in a few different colors so that you guys can see different options. So here's another one done in neutral colors, and I love this one. I think this might be my favorite of them. Um, this one uses the new fabric bundle that I have, the, the soft grays, and then all of the pieces are batik pieces from the warm neutral batiks bundle. And then I've got one more. So for this one, I used the Batik Rainbow Fabric Bundle for the background to get that nice vivid green. And then for the kangaroos, I used the Dots Bundle for most of them. And then I used a little bit of gingham play to get a contrasting light colored pouch on Mama Kangaroo. So that is the kangaroo pattern. I'll be back next month with a new pattern. I'm Wendy from Shiny Happy World. I'll see you next month.